In this video, we're going to talk about extraction, a commonly used technique in organic chemistry. In extraction, we separate an organic from an organic compound by using differences in solubility. So the key concepts of this video will be liquid-liquid extraction and the proper use of a separatory funnel. Extraction is the selective removal of one or more components of a mixture into a separate phase. This technique can be done on a small scale in the organic chemistry laboratory. And it can also be done on a large scale as shown here. This is a five story extraction setup that's used in the production of commodity chemicals. So it's an important process for the generation of medicinal chemistry compounds such as pharmaceuticals, as well as for agrochemicals and materials. There are two basic types of extraction. There's solid liquid extraction, where we extract a component from a solid by using a liquid. A really nice example of this is the removal of caffeine from coffee with dichloromethane. The other type of extraction is a liquid-liquid extraction. In this extraction, we're using two liquid phases, so two solvents, and we can separate compounds between those two thought phases depending on their solubilities. So a real nice example that we'll touch on at the very end of this video is if we had a mixture of sulfuric acid and methyl benzoate combined with water and ethyl acetate, these would be our two solvents, we could separate those two materials. Now, the requirements for a liquid-liquid extraction are that we have two immiscible layers or two solvents. There's the original solvent and an extracting solvent. If there's differing solubility of desired and undesired co compounds amongst these two layers, it's then possible to separate two compounds or more. The piece of glassware that we use to accomplish a separation like this is called a separatory funnel. And there are many different kinds of separatory funnels. Some are all glass, as these two are. This has a glass stopcock and a glass stopper. But it turns out these types of closures are less safe, so we don't use them as much today. And we prefer to use separatory funnels that have Teflon stopcocks and Teflon stoppers. Uh, they're safer, easier to use, and they don't tend to leak as much. When we get leaking by using a separatory funnel, it's usually where the stopper is inserted or at the stop top. In choosing solvents, an original and extracting funnel, generally we want um, an organic solvent and an aqueous solvent because these will be insoluble in each other and form two layers. So we're gonna have an aqueous solution for one layer and then an organic solvent for the other layer. There's several criteria that we have for an extraction solvent. First, it needs to be immiscible with our original solvent. It needs to dissolve our desired compound, our desired organic compound. It should not extract undesired compounds. We want it to be chemically unreactive, so we want it to be inert. We don't want any other reactions occurring which will create additional impurities that we have to remove. It needs to be easily removed after the extraction. So we want it to have a low boiling point. In other words, we want it to be volatile. We don't want it to be too toxic. And ideally it would have a reasonable cost associated. So a good example is carbon tetrachloride is a nice solvent that dissolves many organic compounds. However, it's very expensive. And for that reason, we tend not to use it in extraction. So what are some good organic solvents? Diethyl ether, diethyl ether is your prototypical extraction solvent. Sometimes we call this ether. Other good solvents are ethyl acetate, which has the following structure. And dichloromethane. There are many other possible choices, a few of which are listed below, but these turn out to be poor choices. So hexanes is a very nonpolar compound and it doesn't dissolve polar organic compounds well.
benzene is immiscible in water. It sounds like a good choice, but it's fairly toxic. Toluene is also insoluble in water. It also sounds like a good choice, but it has a boiling point of 110 degrees, which makes it very difficult to remove after the extraction. Methanol, another organic solvent, is soluble in water, so it won't form two layers. So that's not a good choice. And then butane is a gas under ambient conditions, so it would not be useful for most extractions. Diethyl ether, on the other hand, which we're just going to call ether, is immiscible with water. It's nonpolar. It's fairly volatile. It'll boil around 35 degrees Celsius. It's inert. It's relatively non-toxic. However, it should be handled in a fume hood. It's one downside though, is that it is very flammable. So that means that when we use it, we don't use large volumes and we use it in a well-ventilated fume hood. When we perform an extraction, we have several pieces of equipment we used. First, there's something called a ring stand. And then there's a ring clamp that we would attach via this clamping portion to the ring stand. We have our separatory funnel. And here we can see that separatory funnel inserted into the ring from the clamp that's attached to the ring stand. And we want this opening to be sufficiently large so that the stopcock can be inserted through it, but not so large as to allow the separatory funnel to fall through. Now, the next thing is once we have our separatory funnel and our two different layers and we've accomplished our extraction and separated two compounds into those two different layers, we need to know what is where. And to do that, we need to know which solvent we used and what its density was. So if water has a density of around one, and most aqueous layers have densities close to one, if there's something dissolved in it like sodium bicarbonate or salt, it might be slightly larger than one, but close to one. Some solvents are more dense than water, dichloromethane, and so you expect them to be on the bottom. And some solvents are less dense than water, like diethyl ether, and so you expect them to float on water. In this picture on the right here, I have colored the aqueous layer with food coloring. And so that allows me to spot which layer is which very easily. And you can see here where the clear layer is on bottom, that must correspond to dichloromethane, which is also called methane chloride. Whereas here where the clear layer is on top, that means we must have an organic solvent that's less dense than water, so that would be diethyl ether. Now, if you're ever doing an extraction and you've lost track of which layer is which, there's a fairly simple test that you can use. You get a test tube, you fill it with about a milliliter of water, you take two or three do drops of your top layer and you add it to that one milliliter. If all of the material dissolves, then that top layer was your aqueous layer. If you're left with two layers in your test tube or a little bubble of organic solvent, floating on or floating on top of the water, then you know that that top layer was your organic layer. There are many different kinds of separatory funnels. Here I show one with a plain stem and then one with a ground glass stem. As I said before, when we put our separatory funnel together, it can leak either from the top, from the lid or the stopper. In that case, what we would do is we would take out the stopper, inspect it, clean it, and then reinsert it with a slight twist to get a good seal. If it still leaks from the stopper, then you probably have an incorrect stopper and you need to go find the right one that matches that particular separatory funnel. For the stopcocks at the bottom of the separatory funnel, they can be made of glass, in which case grease needs to be used to both lubricate uh, the glass joint and to prevent solvent from leaking out through these edges. With the separatory funnels that we typically use, which employ Teflon stopcocks, we have a particular assembly that when put together properly prevents leaking through these edges here. And so there are three components. There's a Teflon nut, uh, a washer, and a rubber O-ring. If this Teflon nut is loose, it might leak. leak. If you're missing the Teflon washer or the O-ring, it might leak or if you have the incorrect size stopcock for that joint, it also might leak. In terms of putting together the stopcock assembly correctly, there's four parts to the stopcock body, and then there's the separatory funnel itself. 
So here's the stopcock body. We have a Teflon washer, an O-ring, and a Teflon nut. You first insert the stopcock body into the joint, and then you put on the spacer, the Teflon washer here. You then add the O-ring, and then you finally put in the Teflon nut. You then tighten this Teflon nut down to the point where you can still turn the stopcock freely in the joint, but so that there's no wiggle. And under those conditions, it should not leak. When you have your separatory funnel properly assembled, you selected your two solvents and added them to the separatory funnel. Now your task is to make sure those agents equilibrate between the two layers so you can accomplish your separation. And the way we do this is we hold the separatory funnel as shown as here. So you're gripping the stopper tightly into the joint with one hand. You're holding on to the stopcock with your other hand. You would then close the stopcock and vigorously shake the separatory funnel. And then you would vent it. Now, the very first time you begin mixing your materials together, you're going to want to vent it after one solid shake. Uh, and the reason for that is if the solvents are of different composition, there might be a slight exotherm upon mixing, or if you're releasing a gas, you might have pressure buildup. So you want to vent and listen. If you hear a large swooshing sound, you're probably going to want to continue to vent frequently until that sound stops. Otherwise, you can proceed with vigorous shaking for a few seconds followed by intermittent venting. Two or three shakes is about all you need to really mix up the layers well. When you're using your separatory funnel and venting, it's really important that you point the end, the stem of the separatory funnel when you're venting away from people. And that includes yourself and other people because you don't want any stream of material that's suddenly expelled due to a pressure buildup to blow out of the end of here and hit somebody else. So it's very important that you use a separatory funnel in a proper location, ideally a fume hood, and that you make sure it's not pointing towards anyone, yourself, or anyone else. So here's the overall process for using a separatory funnel. We have our trusty ring stand with the clamp on it. We put our separatory funnel in, we close the stopcock, and then we add our two layers. We then insert the stopper, remove from the ring stand, shake, return to the ring stand and remove the stopper. At that point, our separation is completed and we now have two layers containing different components. What we would then do is we would put a flask underneath the separatory funnel and drain one layer. So first the bottom layer would come out, that would be the gray layer here. And then we would swap and put in a second flask and drain the second layer. And so now we have two flasks, one containing each layer. Now, if this particular separation were to have been done using diethyl ether and water, the diethyl ether would have been in the top layer, the water would have been in the bottom layer. So the blue flask would contain the diethyl ether and the gray flask would contain the water. It's really important when you drain from the separatory funnel that you remove the stopper because if you leave a stopper here and open the stopcock, as it's draining out, it's going to create a vacuum in here. And that will create problems when you try and uh, get the remainder of your material out. So we have our successful separation. We have our aqueous layer in one flask and our organic layer in another flask. If we had done a separation of sulfuric acid and methyl benzoate by using diethyl ether and water, what we would have found now, since this blue layer was our top layer, this would have contained the diethyl ether plus methyl benzoate. Whereas the water and sulfuric acid would have ended up in this aqueous layer. So lo and behold, we've com successfully completed a separation of two different compounds into two different solvents, here water and diethyl ether. 